All right, we're reading more Monogatari manga. I hope you like it because we're just gonna marathon through it until we're caught up. And I thought I had already done that. And then two new chapters came out yesterday. So I guess we're quite a far bit behind the Raws, which is exciting. Um, honestly, my big fear for this series is that it's like so high effort and, and such so well done that it feels like unsustainable in a way. And I always feel like after every arc, it's just gonna get cancelled suddenly um that oh great we'll have burned out and sarcastically say oh great more <laughs> i have another like 15 light novels to adapt i'm not feeling it but it looks like at this rate <clears throat> we're at least gonna get through the initial arcs with each girl and then beyond that we'll see what we see and i see uh, a mechanical pencil about two millimeters from my pupil as Senjo Gahara threatens her boyfriend with permanent blindness in that one eye. Did you do something with that girl? Arugikun. And this is, of course, doubly terrifying, not just because you can stab it, but because you can extend the lead. Isn't that so creepy? I, I think the, the horrific elements of the Monogatari series are often underappreciated. Because they're they're kind of subtle and fetishy in their own way. Ah, yes. And here we have a perfect description of subtleness. Araragi envisioning a three-armed pan-religious god of jealousy complete with uh, a doll with a nail driven through it and snakes and cobras and all sorts of other fun. Okay. <laughs> This is, of course, really well done. On topic, Kimberu happens to be my middle school kohai. I was in the track team, she was in the basketball team. We were in different teams, but we both interacted with each other because we were both the aces. She cared for me in so many ways. Aside from that, in many other personal ways as well. Hmm. Just the shot of this pencil. See, it's like kind of a... a, a horrific fetishization, like a nightmare fetishization that I think this series does so well. That it, it, it has the same sort of loving detail that it does for more conventional fan service. But here it's, it's like anti-fan service. <laughs> it's all the same kind of excessiveness, all the same kind of uh, focus and fetishization, but not for the fans' comfort. They're all really pretty close to Camber. Oh, speaking of which, you're my acquaintance, right? <laughs> Look at this imagined Araragi face. Oh my god. Could he ever make a face like that? It's quite a jealous type, and in a way I'm glad. Got to find out about the side of her through this excusable incident. You better hope it's excusable, or else you're never going to get see through your right eye again. You recover from injuries quite quickly, right? So I'm going to pop your eye out. I don't know. I think this is not worth pursuing. <laughs> I think even if you can recover quickly from injury, there's still some damage you can sustain that uh, that might scar you for quite a while. The optical nerves, that's a big one. That's a tricky, tricky one. This shot is awesome, though. The silhouette, that's so cool. And I love the silhouette of the light bulb and the... The, the the kettle as well just kind of making it a more complete scene as if that that lighting eventually is actually flashed onto the stage like that no wavering me whatsoever I'm forever a Senjo Gahara fan sure know how to talk good <sighs> and just like that it's like it never happened oh except that she spilled the tea all over the table and all over her skirt. That was the tea they were drinking, and now it is everywhere. So perhaps an opening emerges after all? So much respect, letting me change so you can try and peek. <laughs> Quick thinking, changing it. <laughs> I like his goldfish shark shirt. I don't think I mentioned that before, but uh, that, that, it's like barely on the outside range of sensible attire. I like it. I'm definitely gonna kill someone soon. 
I'll do it to you. You'll be my first victim, Aragi Queen. I promise I won't choose anyone but you. Wow. And of course, there's kind of a double meaning with her talking about her first time and doing it to you and things like that. But she's definitely playing up here with this smug, faux, innocent smile. What a monster Senjo Gahara is. So powerful. He loves so much he wants to kill you. Being killed by your lover is the best way to die, no? Do I want to die like in the UK Murray series? I don't even know what that is. I guess this is a parody of it. All right, sure. I don't need to look it up. I, I get it enough. <laughs> I like this fake movie poster. What deep love. And how inexplicably there's like a train. <laughs> I guess because it's like a murder mystery or something. And they arrive at some... The Naotsu Osen. And then this murder mystery unfolds. So it, it has that kind of exotic touristy travel type thing. Sure, sure. And then we get some Senjo Gahara changing fan service, as as is tradition. Saint, don't mind getting killed. Hmm. <laughs> That's a pretty strange answer. Regarding your own life or death. I guess you're right. It may not be good. <laughs> I'm killing you, all right? So basically, whoa! When winter ends too. On your deathbed, I will be end up being closer to your side, Arik. Isn't that romantic? Who's gonna kill me out there? I feel like anyone would be a lot better than you. Well, he's gonna find the answer to that at some point. There's certainly no shortage of people that try and often succeed in killing him in this series. <laughs> Both things that would kill a normal person and things that will just kill him as a vampire. I don't like that. Ariragi Kun gets killed by anyone else, then I will kill that killer. That's a promise I will keep. You can die. Can I just set you the five centimeter rule or something? Is that okay? Oh, this bizarre office supply weapon fetishization. Insane. I love this one little shot here of the, the walkway up into their apartment with the little shoe cubby. It's just so real, and it's such like a, a realistic detail. And again, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about in previous chapters, where they they manage to find a space of overlap between the kind of like shaft, impossible, patterned uh, architecture, which exists only kind of as like um, like a like a visual extravaganza like uh <laughs> not not actually as a depiction of some real place but as as like kind of a, an emotional space in which the scene takes place and then they find kind of these these same emotional the the same sort of invocation from things that actually do exist in reality you know the orderliness of the shoe cubby just this this grid that emerges contrary to the the horizontal lines and of the stairs and of the slidings and then the, the, the vertical lines of the flooring and the, the lower part of the walls you see what i'm saying like it it has like a, the same sort of nice visual poetry as the shaft and possible architecture and yet it's constructed only from from realistic things that's so cool that's so cool and what a, sh a, a just kind of like a charming thing to do situating it in the everyday anyways back to the matter at hand that girl Kamburu Sugura she's been clinging to me for some weird reason over the last three days be careful with how you say all of this Haragi kun you know that you are on the edge of the pencil lead and of course this shot of the exterior of the apartment building I don't I feel like I don't even need to say it. like you, you can see what I'm saying all over the place with this right What's flooding above, but burning below? Bath tot, maybe? Oh, mysterious. This is like a kanji joke, I'm pretty sure. Uh, fan service? Kanburu's house. What? <laughs> flooding above, but burning below? Uh, is this another name pun? I was just making a joke. Not exactly a joke. I was just saying that doesn't sound fun at all. Or maybe it's not a kanji joke. Maybe it's just a threat. It's only a threat to both flood and arson. Kanbru's house. 
I don't know about that. Seems a little rude. But whatever. That's Sanjo Gahara for you. One year ago, Kamburu found out the secret of my body. One year before you did our Agikin. And here we see a juxtaposition of Kanburu's monkey arm with this revelation that she knew about this other oddity. So here we can start connecting the dots. Kanburu is familiar with the idea of oddities. She's already stepped past the veil of the supernatural. And then we cut from that meager, incohate explanation to Araragi staring down the monkey fist. Now we are in present day. The residential buildings getting all torn up by her powerful punches. Araragi bleeding profusely manages to grab her leg and use that to swing himself around Three Stooges style, running horizontally along the ground. Oh, you can see Kamaru's butt. It's not going to be the last time. Tell you that right now. It won't be the last time. Look at this. Dodging an, an attack that shatters the concrete. What can he possibly hope to do? How will he get out of this one? Ooh, and then we cut back and forth. Very interesting between the fight and the explanation. Very, very interesting. She tried to help you, knowing her personality. Of course, I refused. You're friends, right? Before now, she's a total stranger. Oh, this is so cool. Dang. Something similar to what I did to you, Aragi Ken. Despite that, you still tried to get involved with me. And there's something similar, of course, as this cute little anthropomorphized stapler reminds us, is that she stapled his dang mouth to try to get him to go away. And only when it miraculously healed up and he said, no, I really can't help you. Look at this. So, we know that Cambru at the time was just a normal human being. And what could she do in the face of a stapler in her face? And this makes us start wondering, how is it that she ended up with this monkey arm? I love the way the monkey arm is depicted in this shot, by the way. It's so cool. I feel, excuse me, I feel like in the shaft animation, I said this before, it was it was kind of just like an icon unto itself. Like you knew what it was. So it was depicted just kind of as that, and it was more about Kamaru herself and the power and what it symbolized. But here, just because of the additional detail that we can give to it, it's becoming much more of its own thing. And really kind of, I think, doing a better job of embodying the great supernatural dread behind it. Now, whether or not that's kind of a red herring will we'll remain to be seen, but um, it, it certainly makes it a lot more evocative, a lot more uh, stimulating to the imagination to, to look at these swirls and this awesome kind of flowing ink effect around it. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Yes, this is it exactly. She's like burning up with it. Ah. Uh, What does Araragi realize? Look at these shots. Oh my god. This is just crazy. I get it, kind of. Those feelings. Kimber never came back. It's as far as our relationship got. Kimber, you wanted to be like me, huh? Ah. Nice, nice, nice! Nice! Look at this. Look at all the visual symbolism here. That we have the eyes once again in the background. Thinking again of how society perceives these two people. How they are seen or not seen respectively. And accordingly, Kanburu is silhouetted in light. Her body is glowing, radiant. Everything is, is focused on her. Whereas Araragi Kun is in shadow, only his closed eye depicted as white. And and the falling megaphone, kind of the, the, the action and the volition that Cambry was hoping to take. So Araragi 
thinking of himself always as lower than Kambru, a completely separate and opposite entity, someone that no one notices, no one sees. And yet, perhaps even because of that, because he was able to live the life that he did, because he was able to stumble into the whole vampire situation, he was able to do what she couldn't. And that was the most important thing to her. And in the end, she wanted to be like me. She wanted to be like me, huh? Oh, so good. So good. It's so cool the roundabout way that this is developed, I think. That, like, just think of the structuring of this arc. First we see the attack. Then we get the long investigation into Kanbaru as a character. The final piece of the puzzle of which is the motivation for the jealousy, which in kind of a simultaneously realization we realize is the motivation for the attack. And yet they're built up, like we both kind of examine Kamburu and Araragi as characters, building them up as much as possible to be opposites, disjoint, parallel, separate, whatever. And it's only in this kind of like last moment, in this this final revelation of this the relationship between Senjo Gahara and Kanbaru, that it's suddenly there's like a bridge. Like suddenly these two separate pillars, she just like snaps in to become involved in Araragi's life. Which is kind of how we see it depicted as well. That all of a sudden she's just there attacking to various levels of real violence. Oh, fantastic. Oh, just such such tight, genius storytelling. And yet, you know, so rambly, so fetishy, so irreverent. And yet when you really boil down the story to its basic elements, it's very, very clever. He really knows what he's doing. Okay, that's all. We will now read chapter 28. I hope you're excited. I'm very excited. We're moving along the uh, uh, Kanbaru arc at a nice pace. Nice, nice. Okay.